one. So far we've discussed what happens with continuous regressors like this one of VMI versus body fat. But what if we have categorical regressors? So let me show you an example. So this data set is taken from the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth in the United States. And the idea was try to analyze the scores of preschoolers given characteristics of their mothers. In this case, you can see the kids score and give it a given test. And here's my, the question if mom finished high school. So as you can see, the data doesn't so much. So the only thing that we can see from this plot is that the data is imbalanced. So we have much more data here than here. But the question is, is this variable affecting the kids score? So let's take a look at the box plot. Mm, this seems that yes, that the answer could be yes. You can see that the median value is higher than this one. The, the interquantile interval is higher this one th than this one. So I, I would say yes, but is there a way to quantify this? So let's do some stuff using R. So let's take this data set. You're going to load this from my GitHub repository. And let's plot simply with, with, with this function box plot. You can actually extract some data. So I'm going to transform this mom has high school to a factor. And then let's see what happens. And here we go. So this is the median, as I was saying, the median for, for the kids whose mother didn't finish high school is 80, and for the ones whose moms finished high school is 92. The interval is more or less between 77 and 103, and the other one is to, from 58 to 95. So I would say yes, but again, is there a way in which we can do that? Is there a way in which we can prove that those medians are clearly different, are significantly different? And can we correct for the imbalance in the data? So I'm going to skip that last question and I'm going to focus in the idea of how to translate this idea that the confidence intervals are disjoint with the idea that the regression is robust. So let's move on a little bit. So how can we understand regression with factors? So here is the idea. We're going to create a dummy variable and we're going to assign zero for the mother didn't finish high school and one for the mother finished high school. And then we're going to do this simple regression. So basically this x, y is a binary number. And as you can see here, when this is zero, this function is simply a constant number plus noise. And when uh, x, i is one, we are simply fitting this, this constant value, which is beta zero plus beta one. So essentially we're not running a straight line for continuous values. We're just taking a couple of discrete numbers. So let's see what happens here. So as I was saying, this line is not very representative because this number is here in the middle doesn't mean a thing. But the idea is that the mean value is beta zero. The mean value for the other group is beta zero plus one plus beta one. So beta one can be understood as the average differences between classes. So this is one way in which we can do uh, regression with factors. Of course, coding high school with one and no high school with zero is arbitrary. So uh, we could do the different codings, but this is only affecting interpretation. So let's change that. Imagine that instead of saying that mom's has finished high school is one and, and the other way is zero, and we replace that by minus one and one. Okay, now our dummy variable would be plus one for mother finished high school and minus one for my mother didn't finish high school. Again, if we replace these numbers here, you can see that now regression has a different, a different meaning. So now for the mother didn't finish high school uh, uh, class, the, the kids score is simply beta zero Ma minus beta one and for the other group is beta zero plus beta one so now the interpretation is slightly different so now this is the average value this is the other average value and now beta zero is somewhere somewhere in the middle so uh, now beta zero has the interpretation of what's the average output ignoring the high school effect you can do that with uh, clearly with r this is very simple you didn't say anything this mom Mom high school is corrected inside this LM function as zero and one. Otherwise, you have to create a new variable. I'm calling here this mom high school two, and you can see the code in the description. And as you can see, the, the, the intercept is different, the slope is different, and the reason why this is happening is because now the interpretation is different. But as you can see here, R square and the corrected R square are the same because the regression is exactly the same. Also, the significance of the feet is the same. So there are the same numbers all over the place. So this is like a change of units. So instead of playing with zeros and ones, we're scaling the variable between minus one and one. But this, of course, is not changing the regression. So in a previous video, we discussed that doing a linear regression is not just clicking in R and calling some function. So the, 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 
thing that you have to do always is checking if your regression is good enough. So in this case, it's hard to tell because we have just a couple of observations, one for each group. And in that case, if you take a look at the, at the residuals, they are always going to be flat because you are basically drawing a line between two points. So the, the only thing that you can see is that there are a lot of outliers. So this is the, the residuals are clearly not a linear function, sorry, not a normal distribution. And we're going to discuss why it's happening this for this particular data set and has to do with other variables playing a role here. So next question, what if we have a factor with more than two levels? So the wrong approach would be use factors as numbers, for example, with three levels. So imagine that we have this information. So we have three categories, A, B, and C. As I was saying, the wrong, the wrong way to approach this would be to consider this A, C, row B is one and C is two. Why is this a mistake? Because now th there is no numerical relationship between them. Before it was just arbitrary, so we could use 0 and 1 or minus 1 and 1. But now it doesn't mean that B is larger than A is the same as C larger than B. They are just different factors. So the typical mistake is taking just a linear regression as these were numerical variables with only three values. Why is this a mistake? Because basically you're trying to find a compromise solution. So in, in this case, trying to fit a line along this numerical value is going to misfit uh, the, the points here in the middle and the points here and below, okay? So never do this. So whenever you have more than two levels, never use a simple linear regression. What you have to do, you have to do, and we have covered this before when we talk about classification, is transform the m levels of this factor to m minus one dummies, okay, dummy variables. For instance, imagine that we have a, b, and c. So now we're going to code this with just two of them. So a is going to be a binary number, and now a is going to be one in the variable a, zero in the variable b. b is going to be zero for a and one for b, and the missing uh, category, which is c, would be zero in both cases. So this is the right way to do things. And now what's the interpretation of regression? So you can see here, so if you plug these numbers there, then w when a and b are zero, basically you're describing c. So now beta zero is the mean value of what's the score, for instance, for the kids for category c. When a is one and the other is zero, now we have beta zero plus beta two. So this is simply characterizing category b. And beta zero plus beta one is the mean value for all the, all the uh, points in the data set describing category A. So now beta zero, beta one, and beta two have a clear interpretation in terms of A, B, and C. So the good thing is that we don't have to do this manually. So whenever we call LM in R, basically R is going to do this for us. So take a look at this example. And what, what is happening there geometrically is something like this. So we're replacing this problem, which we have three classes by new variables. And these new two variables, x1 and x2, are basically changing this one-dimensional problem into a two-dimensional problem, describing all these three categories. And now we are doing a multiple linear regression instead of a simple linear regression. Okay? Now we don't have to do this, uh, let's say, compromise between the lines. And now the lines are, have different interpretations. It's like having different slopes here and there. And those slopes are related to beta 1 and beta 2. Okay? So this is the right way to do things. I want to finish this video talking about something which is not very well known for a statistician and machine learning practitioners, and it's called the Simpsons Paradox. On, and, and could be summarized something like uh, how the lack of factors can, can mess things up. So let's download this data set. Again, you can download this from my GitHub account. And let's take a summary of the data. And as you can see here, if we just do a summary of this fitting between Y and X, we see something like this. So we have this intercept, which is hard to interpret, and we have this slope, which is 1.75. Okay, now uh, R square and adjusted R square are pretty large, so one could be happy with this sort of regression. And again, this slope is very significant, so you can see that the, this value plus minus twice this number is far away from zero, so this, this is why this is a very significant parameter. But it, what if we take a look at the data and we plot? When we take the plot, we see something weird here. So the residuals are pretty normal, so this is nice, but we see this sort of a strange pattern here. Of course, the residuals are almost flat, and, and this red line is almost like a horizontal line, but there's something weird happening here. And again, one of the best advices that I can give you uh, all along this course is that first, before doing any machine learning, fitting or whatever, you have to plot the data. When you plot the data, you see something like this. So this is what's happening. So we have all the points in the data set in just one category. So when you're trying to draw this line, 
basically you're saying that everything should fit in this trend, positive trend. But what if you divide this in categories? So imagine that this is one group, this is another group, and so on and so forth. This is the Simpsons paradox. So level by level, all the slopes are negative. But when you aggregate all the data, you have a positive regression. So the Simpsons paradox is that a positive trend appears for separate groups, whereas a negative trend appears when the groups are combined. So probably you're thinking, okay, this is an academic example, but what happens in real life? So let me show you a real, a real life example. So this data set is, uh, is trying to collect some information about delay by two different airline companies, Alaska Airlines and America West. So forget about the details about this command. The, the idea here is that if you take a look at those companies, you can see that overall, if you divide the number of delayed flights for Alaska Airlines, you have this number here. So it's 100 divided by 100 plus 654. And this is 13% of the flights are delayed. And you do the same for America West, you can see that you have 157 delayed out of, well, let's say 1,286 plus 157. So this is uh, around 11%. So if you take a look at this raw data, you would say, okay, America West seems more reliable. But this is the problem. The problem is that we are aggregating for airlines and airports. So what happens if we take a look at the data? Okay, we took a look at the data. We have something very striking. So airport by airport, you could see that Alaska Airlines is more reliable than America West. So how on earth is possible that when you aggregate the data, you see something like this in which America West seems more reliable, so it has less delayed flights. But when you compare airport by airport, the black lines are always low, lower than the red ones. So the answer to this question is very simple. The idea is that not all the airports are equally represented. So basically you could say that for America West, Phoenix is the most, the flight that is collecting all, almost all the flights. And for Alaska Airlines, Seattle is the, the airport that is collecting all the data. So it's like if you're replacing all these small little points and you replace all the information by this huge red cycle. And for the black ones, it's the same. So basically these airports are marginal and all the information is collected in Seattle. So this is the Simpsons paradox. So if you aggregate, basically you're replacing all the data by the highest one, or the one which is more represented, you would say that the reds are the winners, which is what we did here. But if you compare airport by airport, I would say that mm, this is not true. And actually interactions matter. So basically I would say that Alaska Airlines is better than America West. So airport by airport is more reliable in all the cases. So the moral of this story is that you have to be very careful with factors and we have to be very careful with interactions and I'm going to devote another video for that.